Hey guys, good morning. morning. My name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at Gateway, and we're really glad that you've decided to join us. Uh, As Sherry mentioned a few minutes ago, Young Life is one of the ministries that we partner with here at Gateway, and we would love so much for you to get involved. So make sure after after our time today that you stop by her table. It's right outside, literally right behind the sound booth over here in the back of our uh, sanctuary. And so we would love for you to, to get a chance to meet her and partner with her. We are going to do a little bit of a thought experiment to start out today, okay? So follow along with me here. What in your mind, and you don't have to say it out loud, what in your mind does God value in humans or in a person? Now, there's a lot of different ways we could go with this question, right? We could talk about this idea that all humans are made in God's image. That's what the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter one. We're all made with some of his characteristics in us. Not all of them, but some of them. Our ability to love other people, I believe, is a strong characteristic unique to God that was given to us as his image bearers. And when we're talking about value in that context, all people are valuable, right? It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your family history is, what your ethnicity is, the color of your skin, the level of your intellect, the time in history in which you were born. None of it matters if you're looking at it from the perspective of being an image bearer of God. If you ask that same question to culture, you get a different kind of answer, don't you? What makes a person valuable in 21st century America probably looks a little bit different. It probably has something to do with your power, with your influence, with the kind of content that you put on social media, with your wealth, with how good looking you are and so on. But is that really the way that God views us in terms of value? One of the most important jobs in history was given to a 12-year-old girl 2,000 years ago named Mary. And her job was to carry and care for the Messiah. That's a pretty big job description. I mean, we're not talking about a normal kid like my kids, and I love my kids, but we're not talking about normal kids. We're talking about the king of the universe here. So why did God pick Mary? Well, it certainly wasn't because of her wealth. She was poor. It certainly wasn't because she was influential. She certainly wasn't that. It wasn't because she was overly wise or well-learned. She was 12, maybe 13 years old. What does God value in a person? Today, we're gonna explore that question by looking at, a little bit more closely at Mary. And so I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna dive into our text for this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for speaking to us and teaching us through it. God, I pray that you would be here in a really profound and and wonderful way today. I pray, God, that you would help us to see you in a little bit different way. I pray, Lord, that you would not allow us to leave this place the same way that we came in, but transform us, God. Lord, I ask that you would... Speak through me that it would be your words and not my own. We love you. We look forward to what you're going to do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab it real quick. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, starting verse 39. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. We're going to read through verse 56. If you don't have a Bible, that's totally fine. We do have extras as a side note. So if you don't have a Bible and you want one, just come find me. I'll hook you up. Other than that, you can find one on your phone or you can follow along on the screens behind me. Luke 1, verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. We are gonna spend a lot of time on that verse in a minute. Verse 46, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. So this week, we are in week three of our series called Preparation. And in this series, we're looking at the events early in the life of Jesus Christ. Actually, at this point in the story, we are still prior to his birth. Week one, we unpacked, uh, Jeff Hill is a member of our teaching team, unpacked the book of Luke. Uh, this text that we're in is where we're going to be for quite a while. It's a long, rich book. And we talked about how it's an ancient biography he did uh, and about how an ancient biography is set up slightly differently than a modern biography. And he just kind of built this beautiful picture of sort of what the whole uh, book of Luke is all about, who Luke was as an author and so on. Last week, we dove a little bit more into the material, into the backstory of the birth of these two men or pre-birth of these two men. John the Baptist being one, he was a forerunner of Jesus, someone that would point to Jesus later on in his ministry. And then Jesus himself, who was born from the Virgin Mary, the person that we're talking about at length today. Last week when we were talking about them, we uh, were discussing them in the context of God's plan always coming to fulfillment no matter what happens, right? We talked about how Zechariah and Elizabeth, that's these two older people, they were unable to have kids when they were younger, and yet God's plan would not be set aside. They ended up having a baby. We talked about how Herod, the king of this region at this point in time, was this super evil guy, wanted nothing to do with uh, having a new king, a new king of the Jews come into power, and yet God's plan happened no matter what. We talked about Mary a little bit too and about how her as a young girl, uneducated, unwealthy, unimportant ultimately, about how God's plan wouldn't be set aside in her life either, but rather God would work in miraculous ways to have Jesus be born through her. Today, we're continuing to explore Mary's story in particular. And what we're going to see is kind of these two sections in the text. The first is our interactions with Elizabeth. We're going to kind of break that down, specifically looking at that verse 45, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But then the second portion of our time, with the time that we have left, we're going to look at this incredible poem that she recites or song that she sings called the Magnificat. I don't know who named that, but no cat is magnificent. You know, I'm just saying I had to. No cat is magnificent. But nonetheless, uh, whoever named it, it's this beautiful poem, this beautiful outburst of, of love and praise to God. And we're going to talk about that as well as we explore what does it mean to value God, okay? Or what is, I'm sorry, what does God value in us, rather. So let's go back. Let's start in verse 39. We'll just plow through this in our time today. Verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago, Mary is not old. She is a child. 
I have a 12-year-old son, my oldest son. He's 12, 12 and a half, actually. He'll be 13 in June. And I love my kids. I love my son. I love this, this season that he is navigating into. But when I sit back and think about the possibility of him being a parent, at 12 years old, I get a little freaked out. Anybody else? Yep, that's right. If you have a 12-year-old, if you've ever been around a 12-year-old, you should be raising your hand right now. This is a really big statement that God is using someone so young to bring Jesus into the world. Mary, in this story, she leaves her home, what presumably seems to be right after what happened in the prior text. Well, what happened in the prior text? An angel visited Mary said, you're going to have a baby. It's going to be miraculous the way you're gonna have a baby, by the way, not by natural means, but by supernatural means. Oh, and your relative Elizabeth is also having a baby. Now, we don't know exactly what the relationship between Elizabeth and Mary was. We do know that they were somehow related, perhaps cousins, perhaps second cousins, Family units were closely knit together in the first century. And so regardless of how, we know that they were close enough that Mary, without being prompted by God, decides to literally leave her home, travel around 70 miles on foot to see her cousin or relative, Elizabeth. Now that's crazy, especially when you don't have cars. Because 70 miles would take several days of hard hiking along the road, camping out or staying in someone else's home. This is a really big deal for a, let me remind you, 12-year-old. And yet Mary goes, she wants to see Elizabeth. She wants to celebrate what God's doing in her to share then also what has gone on in her own life. She shows up at Zachariah's house, Zachariah and Elizabeth's home. And she greets Elizabeth and something kind of strange happens. The child that is in Elizabeth has been growing there for several months, leaps inside of her belly right? The uh, John the Baptist, the last of the great prophets of the Old Testament is for the first time prophesying exactly who Jesus is when Jesus is only a few cells big. Isn't that cool? Elizabeth is then filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she goes on and says this, starting in verse 42. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. So Elizabeth, she says a lot of different things, but she says this one word, blessed, three different times. So what does the word blessed mean? When we say blessed, what are we referring to? Well, blessed can mean several things. It can mean happy, right? You're happy. You're in a good place. You're in a good mood. You're where you should be, and things are all going well for you. That can be one meaning of the word blessed. Blessed can also mean that you've got God's favor on you, that for some reason, something that you have done has given God a reason to give you thumbs up. And he's happy with the way you're living life right now. That's another meaning of the word blessed. Blessed could also mean that you have God's favor, but not because of anything you did. Let that sink in for a second. Blessed could also mean that simply because God loves you, you are approved, you are favored by God. And what Elizabeth is saying here, I believe, is that. That for whatever the reason, God chose you and you therefore are approved, you are favored by God above all. All women, that's not just between you and me and your family and your close friends, that's all women in history. Compared to all of them, you are most blessed. And the child also in you is blessed because of you. The baby inside me jumped for joy. And then this incredible statement in verse 45, you are blessed because you believed 
that the Lord would do what he said. The key here, the key to God's blessing, the key to God's valuing of Mary is that she believed that God would do what God said he would do. Belief is a really hard thing. Trust in what God is gonna do is a really tough thing. Anybody tr struggle trusting God sometimes? If I can get my words out. Anybody? Well, you don't have to admit it, but I certainly do. I asked a question on Instagram this week just to kind of get a feel for where people were at. And I said, do you struggle with trusting God? And the large majority of people, in fact, almost everybody that responded back to me said, yes, at times they do. And I asked, why is that? Why is it that we struggle trusting God? And for some people, it's that they don't know what's gonna happen and it's hard and there's a fear element to it. For some of us, we don't trust God because we like to be in charge. That one is me. I like to be in control. And when you trust God, sometimes you can't really be fully in control, can you? Mary was blessed because she believed that God would do what he said he would do. And Mary had a lot to lose. You see, it's easy enough to trust someone or something when you don't have a lot on the line. But Mary literally had everything to lose if God did not do what he said he would do. You see, here's the situation. Mary is a young, engaged woman in the first century living in a theocracy, I'll explain that in a second, in a theocracy that is driven by moral law that would have put her to death, right? For infidelity. Let me explain that a little bit more. In first century Jewish culture, what guided political law was religious law. In other words, what the Bible said is right and wrong was what the society of the Jewish people believed was right and wrong. And so if you didn't worship God, if you didn't worship God according to the way that the Bible said, then you were actually politically breaking the law as well as just breaking a religious law, if that makes sense. Now, of course, all of this is under the uh, overarching government of the Roman Empire. The Israel, Israelite nation was not their own nation. They were a people group under the submission of another people group. But nonetheless, they had the ability to exercise their religious beliefs. And so what that means is, if you're outside of doing what you're supposed to do, you could have really significant punishment. In the Old Testament, if you committed adultery, you could be executed. You could be stoned. At best, you would be cast out of culture, out of society. You would be looked down on your entire life. You would have no opportunity to make anything of your life because everyone would see you with the scarlet letter, if you will, of adultery. You would never have a chance to get past it. Most women that weren't married, most women that had committed adultery, that had been in that situation, would end up living life on the streets if they survived at all. Many would starve. They would be outcast completely. There would be literally no hope. And she didn't have a strong financial network. Her family was poor. And so literally, she had to risk her entire life to trust God. If God did not come through, she could die. There was enormous cost, enormous at risk, enormous amounts on the line. If Mary, for whatever the reason, let me rephrase, if God, for whatever the reason, did not come through for Mary. And yet, she trusted and believed in what God said would happen. The history would prove her to be right. Jesus would be born. Joseph, her, in, her fiance, would not leave her. 
Though there certainly would have been some hard questions, some raised eyebrows, she did okay in her life. But try to put yourself in that situation when you're considering trusting God. It's easy to say, okay, God, I'll trust you. But when life gets really hard, when there's stuff on the line, when it's my job, when it's my relationships, when it's the way that people look at me, when saying I'm a Christ follower and my job will have people look down on me and could cost me that promotion, that opportunity or whatever, am I willing to do it? Am I willing to trust you, God, enough for that? That's the question. But we see Elizabeth says it so clearly. You are blessed, you are approved by God because you trusted him. Trust is an interesting idea. Trust is this idea that we open up our hands to what it is that God wants to do. Usually in church, we, we have a, a little bit of a weird relationship with what our actions are supposed to be. And what I mean by that is not that um, we shouldn't live moral lives, but I've said this before, and maybe you've heard this if you've been in church before. Christianity is not a religion about trying to earn God's favor. You ever heard that before? It's not about saying, if you do all the right things, then God's gonna bless you or God's going to approve you. That's not what this is about. What we are called to is to trust, which is simply to say, I'm opening my hands, God, to what it is that you wanna do. Mary is blessed because she lets God be the star of the show. Mary is blessed because she lets God be the star of the show, not her. And so when we're talking about what does it mean, what does God value in a person? He values submission. He values trust. He values the ability for us to say, God, take over my life. Take over what it is that you wanna do. Do what you wanna do in me. Don't let it be my priorities. Don't let it be my, my actions or my words or my whatever. Let it only be you, not me. We're meant to be dependent on God, not to try to live our lives on our own. Mary then goes into this next section and begins this incredible poem. And there's so much in this poem and, and honestly so much that we're just not gonna be able to, to dive really into today. We're just gonna kind of look at it as an overview. But what I want you to notice in it is Mary's posture, right? What Mary, the place she puts herself in and more importantly, the place that she puts God in. So let's look at this quickly here. Starting in verse 46, this first three verses is Mary talking about herself. Mary responded, oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. So it's super interesting the way that she packages this together. She starts out by saying, oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My whole being worships and praises you, puts you, God, on the throne first and foremost. She ends this section by again acknowledging who God is. For the mighty one is holy, right? So she literally bookends this entire, well, these several verses by calling on God and putting him on the throne first and foremost. She then says in verse 48, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. She humbles herself of me as a lowly servant. God, you noticed me. And because you now noticed me, generations are gonna call me blessed. Now, I don't think that she's saying that in a prideful way. I think she's just simply saying what's true. You're going to call me blessed because of what you're doing, God. Nations are gonna call me blessed. Generations are gonna call me blessed. Forever, God, you are going to be made famous for what you're doing in me. The next section, she switches from being about her and about her relationship with God to the communal relationship with God. Verse 50, he shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. 
His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. So in this section, she's talking about the communal relationship between God and all humans. For those that fear you, that respect you, that revere you, you give mercy to them. This idea of mercy is such a powerful image because it's this image of being in a courtroom. Imagine yourself in a courtroom and you're being accused and the reality is is that you're guilty for whatever it is. But instead of getting what is due to you in punishment, the judge gives you mercy, lets you off the hook with less than what you deserve. For those that revere God, generation after generation after generation, God gives us not what we deserve. And that's awesome because I know me and I know I deserve a lot worse than what I have been given in my life. Oh, and by the way, you probably know you. And you probably are worse than you might show other people. And God might be merciful to you too. You show mercy to generation after generation of those who fear and revere you. Your mighty arm has done tremendous things. You've scattered the proud and the haughty. You've brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. I love this imagery of you've taken those that are proud and you've made them humble. You've given them something to make them recognize who you really are. You've taken the lowly and you've made them exalted in the sight of others. Look, God, at what it is that you've been doing. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. And then in verse 54 and 55, she closes it by looking at Israel specifically. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful for he made his, this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed, verse 56, with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. So what do we, what do we learn from this? about what it is that God values in humans. We learn that God values humility, that God values being worshiped by people. We learn that God desires for us to put him on the throne, that that's the right place for him to be, not for us to be there, but for him to be there. We have not learned that when we value God most, when we follow his plans, that life is easy. It doesn't mean it's always gonna work out the way we expect it to. It doesn't mean it's always gonna be simple and straightforward. It's gonna sometimes be messy and complicated. But when we trust and follow God, when we trust and follow his plan for our lives, when we submit our will to his will and we say, God, you are the one that this is all about. My hands are open. Let it be about what you wanna do and not me. God does something really amazing. And so that's my challenge for you. Is to open up your hands in life and say, okay, God, well, what do you wanna do? What do you want to do, God? I want to trust you. What does it look like for me to trust you? In my job, with my spouse, with my kids, with my parents, with my grandparents. What does it look like for me to trust you with my money, with my leisure, with my entertainment, with my fill in the blank? Ask that question of yourself because while it might be really hard to get the answer that you might get, God will do immensely more through you if you keep your hands open than you could ever imagine. So my challenge is to have the courage, like Mary did, to trust God in your life and to see what he will do through you. Lord, thank you for this time you've given us to spend together today, this incredible example in Mary of 
of someone who chose to believe and to trust you, and boy, she had a lot to lose if it didn't work out, but I'm thankful, God, that you came through for her. You always come through. God, I pray that wherever we're at today, wherever we're at with our trust in you, that you would elevate that, that you would allow us to trust you more. Maybe we're people that have followed you for a long time and trust in you is is not as hard. Maybe, Lord, we're just still trying to figure you out and we don't really know where we stand with you, but maybe trust in you is a really, really big step. God, I pray that you would help us to take that, that first step. Lord, we need you. I ask that you would transform us by your power. In Jesus' name, amen.